Anatoly, thanks for joining me on Real Vision. I'm really excited to chat. This has been I've been following the Solana project for quite a while in the ecosystem the last couple of years, and I think you guys have done something pretty special. It's been um, obviously the last. I think you guys have had a big benefit the last year. Lots of uh, excitement around the project, starting to see some real developer traction, some real usage. Um, maybe can you give me a brief overview of what Solana is, and then maybe we'll talk about how you kind of got started. Um. Yeah, so Solana is a high-performance layer one network. Uh, it's kind of a mouthful, right, to say that. <laughs> uh, you can think of it as a, I, I think of it as like a communications layer, just like wireless, you know, AT&T or Verizon. They run on these things called um, like towers, right, that could send information between each other. That's really what Solana is. It's like a, a bunch of independent validator nodes that send information to each other, but do it at the fastest, cheapest, you know, as close to real time as possible way. Um, so contra contrary to that, I mean, maybe that's a little different than than the way a lot of people have been looking at traditional kind of blockchain or DLT networks, right? Not necessarily, I think it's interesting that you put it as an information kind of super highway almost, yeah. as opposed to uh, a monetary network. Um, is that because of the background that you kind of came from or? Yeah, probably. I mean, like, the, you know, like um, I spent my career at Qualcomm working on uh, operating systems firmware, but, you know, Qualcomm is a wireless company. So just through osmosis, LTE, CDMA, like my first project was uh, push to talk that we, we were optimizing to get like, you know, push to a chirp from SF to like Hyderabad in like 80 milliseconds. So it was like, <laughs> it was a, uh, that, that kind of stuff where like, okay, we have a, an event that happens in one place. How do we get that one bit across to the place where it's going to as fast as we can? It was just always in my mind, you know, at the lowest level in the chip to the network layer. Um, so when I, I had the idea for, for Solana, it really came from this, Eureka moment where, you know, as the legend goes, I had two, co two coffees and a beer at Cafe Soleil in San Francisco. <laughs> I was up till four in the morning and I couldn't sleep. And I had this realization that there's a way to encode passage of time as a data structure. Like proof of work encodes uh, thermodynamic energy as a data structure, right? That proof of zeros in a, in a, in a proof of work block that miners produce. It means somebody somewhere spent real electricity generating it. Um, so this thing, proof of history, is a verifiable delay function, which is a data structure that when you look at, you have this guarantee that it took some real amount of time, no matter how much electricity or compute power the other person had to generate. Um, if, the, if you assume that the fastest fabrication process they have is something out of TSMC or not, uh, you know, a million times better, right? And maybe it's two times better or something like that. You can kind of, you can kind of start putting bounds on the time aspect of it. And time is critical to radio networks. If you remember physics, two radio towers transmitted at the same time or the same frequency, you get noise because radio interferes um, with each other. So first optimization anyone ever tried was why don't we give each tower a clock and we alternate by time. So if we have a very synchronized clock, the towers can rotate. And this is literally how 2G net networks work because your phone yeah. is, a, is both a receiver and a transmitter, so it is a tower. And you can think of, you know, your phone connected to some tower that actually has backbone to the internet is coordinating between all the other phones to figure out who can transmit at what frequency at what time. And that time division, multiple access, TDMA is the foundation of um, cellular networks. So once I knew I had that component, I knew I could build a fast blockchain because you have a similar problem in blockchain where if two block producers produce a block at the same time, you get a fork, that's noise, same, same kind of noise, information noise. So if you remove that possibility of, of forking, you, you reduce the probability of it that it can still happen because we're still dealing with computers, stuff that fails. Um, you can speed this thing up to levels that are as close to Web2, like real-time systems as possible. And why I thought like this thing was an information system is um, 
censorship resistance, like what is interesting about blockchain from anything else from a Postgres database running on, on AWS is this idea of censorship resistance. And a lot of folks think of it in, in different ways. Bitcoin folks tend to think of it, if I have my Bitcoin five years from now, there isn't some state, you know, like the US government or some Chinese government that prevents me from spending it, right? That eventually I can spend my Bitcoin. That's what people think about censorship resistance and proof of work store value kind of thing. But if you ever traded, if you ever been um, used any kind of trading API, there's this other idea of censorship resistance where if I connect to interactive, to interactive brokers and I submit a trade, 50 other people get a look at it before it actually hits the market. <laughs> and each one of them takes a few bips off here and there. By the time yeah. it gets there, the opportunity that I saw was already taken and I'm always last in line. And there's this idea of real-time censorship resistance, which we're focused on, which is if you, you know, roll up your sleeves, you build a machine and you go set it up at your local co-location, anybody can do this, take you a weekend, you will be on the same level playing field as the best market makers in the world, as the best exchanges. And not only that, that network that guarantees that can be competitive with NASDAQ because we can transmit and synchronize information around the world at the same speed as news that is important to mar markets travels around the world. So speed of light to fiber is still a limiting factor, right? If some event that's market worthy happens in Singapore, it's got to propagate to a trader just looking at a Bloomberg terminal, right? In New York, it's still speed of light to fiber. By the time it gets there, that state transition for that market is already propagated through some marketplace like Serum and Solana. So when you look at it, you see the exact same price, right, as a trader. So just with volunteers, open source software, hardware that's built by people, not special hardware, this is stuff you can buy at Fry's if Fry's was still open. <laughs> and, uh, and like, go, go deploy these systems yourself. You can be at the same level playing field as the best traders, the best market makers in the world. Um, and that's a really cool thing, you know. I don't, I don't know what it's worth or like what its impact in the world is going to be, but I felt that it was important enough to build because of my experiences with like interactive brokers, and they're the best in class, and like <laughs> and, and stuff like that. I want to unpack that a little bit because I think um, when I saw the white paper come out, I didn't totally understand it to be honest. But I, I actually feel like I can relate a little bit more than maybe the average Real Vision uh, listener because coming out of university, my computer science, my first job out of computer science went from an internship to a, to a full-blown career, was uh, working for a startup doing mobile uh, data analytics. So I had to really get familiar with CDMA, TDMA, uh, LTE as that was starting to come around, like what the, the packets actually looked like you know, we were, we were deep in it. And so I think when I saw your Medium post from a couple of years ago, kind of breaking down the different technology pieces, I was like, holy shit, this is genius. <laughs> it, it's a really clever take because, yeah, I had this same kind of hunch. I was like, why wouldn't these networks, like, how do we scale? One of the high level thesis I've been having is like, okay, blockchains are probably just going to scale the same way cell phone networks did, right? Where it's like you have this common... Uh, this common core kind of consensus mechanism or technology, and then people are building like purpose-built or regional specific kind of networks. Uh, and so I think it's really genius how you guys were thinking about the proof of time um, piece. And so clearly, you know, I think there's a lot of parallels to the, the telephony um, background that you've got. How, how do you connect up? I mean, I guess like wh when was this? When were you having this beer and coffee uh, bender? Twenty. So 2017, um, my buddy of, of mine, who's a co-founder, Stephen, uh, we had this cheesy startup that was building um, GPU-based deep learning systems at like our local colo. And while we didn't have any customers, we were mining crypto. 
And this is when we started like ruminating, okay, why do we even need to do this? Why, why is it worth anything? This whole thing, a scheme, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. I think a lot of us who've been through the last few cycles at least have had those moments where you're like, what am I doing here? And why is this even a thing? Yeah. <laughs> and you start getting into this, okay, there is, it's bound by physics and that's what makes it cool, right? It's bound by real entropy. And this, I was like, started like, well, what are the other physical limits that we have, right? Space and storage. But then I thought, okay, if we do space, then it's just going to get like into a real estate war, right? Like who has the most amount of tape drives, <laughs> like, which is just as Chia. bad as it. I mean, yeah. we basically have this, this thing with Chia. We'll see. I mean, it's an interesting concept. I think you're right. Like, you know, uh, finite resources or proof of finite resources, time, energy, space you know it, these are they're promising i think we'll see i'm kind of with you and there's a little bit of bias here because i'm i'm with you a bit the telephony background i think like i think this is the winning strategy personally we'll see what happens with the energy side but anyway keep so, going sorry so the nice thing about time right is it costs no energy right it is extremely energy efficient and it is a physical resource that doesn't occupy any space, right? <laughs> it just passes for free. That's <laughs> the great one. So, and when that clicked, I, it, it honestly, it felt like, um, I don't know if you ever read like Malice, PKD, science fiction, where they're like an alien beam something into this character's brain. It felt yeah. like that. I couldn't sleep for like a week. I was like fairly manic. Uh, <laughs> it was like a true eureka moment experience as like you know just the the greeks describe right or whatever like yeah pretty pretty awesome um from that perspective um because like in physics there is actually no mathematical definition of time right the einstein equations work forwards and backwards in time it's really hard to like um the, the, there is no definition of the era of time in terms of entropy moving forward. And even this idea of pre-image resistance is based on an assumption that is that like we can't reverse these computations, that they're not reversible. So this really goes down into this rude intersection of math and physics and like how all this stuff like fits together in the universe, right? Like so. <laughs> so there's like a, you know, you, you kind of like the root group Goldberg construct uh, an era of time, right? Like it was pretty, pretty cool. And I couldn't find anybody else that was doing this. Like, and right after I quit my job, got a tiny bit of funding from like just friends from underwater hockey of all, of all places <laughs> to, to get me started. Uh, and uh, I started seeing in 2018 papers coming out from like Dan Bonet and a bunch of other amazing folks that have been working on verifiable delay functions. And then, then those things click. Hey, if you like this clip, be sure to like and subscribe for more crypto related content. Also be sure to check out the full interview and more only on realvision.com slash crypto.